Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Earlier this year, data released from a maternal health committee showed a huge racial disparity in maternal health outcomes in New York City. In the Bronx in particular, the mortality rate is far higher than the rest of the city. And with CDC numbers showing that black women are more than three times likely to die of a pregnancy-related cause, Concerns have been raised. Alarm bells have been ringing. It's an issue that the Bronx Borough President has placed on the center of her desk, and tonight she talks to us about how to address the issue head on. We're also going to talk with a doctor from Jacoby Medical Center who can give us a look at the range of maternal issues faced by Bronx women. So please join me in welcoming the borough's 14th borough president, the Honorable Vanessa Gibson. Nice to have you back Thank on the you. program. Thank you. Good to be back again. And uh, the vice chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Jacoby Medical Center. It is uh, Dr. Veronica Addis. Dr. Addis, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Um, Madam Borough President, let, let's start. Uh, I um, counted in the years, in your years in public office, in the legislature, the council, and now as borough president, you've been on our program 23 times. Okay. We've talked about <laughs> housing, the environment, crime, economic development. I think that was the last show we did. Numerous other issues. Why right now is maternal health high on your priority list for the borough of the Bronx? The time is now. Uh, we've sounded this alarm for many years uh, to address maternal mortality and morbidity uh, and the high rates of just health care inequity. Black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth because of insufficient health care, because they don't have access to doulas and birth workers and midwifery services and prenatal and postnatal care. We want to set our birthing individuals and our black women and Latina women up for success and not failure. I look at this work from an equity fairness and justice perspective. It is an injustice if black and Latino women are not given sufficient and quality health care. And for years we've heard cases and we have the testimony and the stories of so many black women that have not been given prenatal care, that didn't have a doula, didn't have a midwife, were told they had to have a C-section and many other hereditary issues and health disparities that they faced. And unfortunately, some of them died during childbirth. And now their partners have become advocates. They're raising their children without a partner, without a wife. And that's unacceptable for me. As a black woman, as a woman of color, my deputy and I take this very seriously, very personal. We're very intentional about this work. We want to create a Bronx birthing center where we have wraparound services, trauma-informed care, health care, and all of the essentials that all of our mothers and our birthing individuals need. I want, we're going to show some numbers through the program. Uh, we're going to put the first one up um, just in general. And, and as I did the research for this, it, it was striking. And that is uh, maternal mortality, um, deaths per 100,000. New York City has 22.9 um, per 100,000, and the Bronx has 36.2, 36.2 um, women uh, out of 100,000 um, died mm -hmm. of pregnancy-related causes. You've called this um, a healthcare crisis rooted in discrimination. Yep. Um, how does systemic racism and bias play in this process and lead to the kind of numbers that we talk about? It plays about? a major role. The social determinants of health uh, and many of our working class families that are living in poverty, that are earning poverty wages, that don't have access to quality uh, health care, uh, they're not living in stable housing. There are lots of factors that, w that attribute to those numbers. And while it's alarming, it's not surprising. The Bronx has always, for a very, very long time, been last in everything good and first in everything bad when it comes to mm. health outcomes. So that's why we're focusing on climate change, environmental justice, health care, economic development, capping the cross Bronx so that we're not breathing in unhealthy air and have the highest rates of asthma surrounded by highways like the Cross Bronx Expressway. There are a lot of things that we can do, but it's rooted in systemic racism. It's rooted in discrimination against people of color and women of color, and it's not acceptable. So this is an issue that has been going on for quite some time, but we have an opportunity in the Bronx to right this wrong, to set women up for success, and to really make sure that the health care system is equitable for all people. You know, the, the, the um, concept of systemic racism, um, should we talk about how to deal with that, you know, for, at, at the foundation level, or is your approach now to say, well, that exists, 
but let's deal with all the consequences of it so that we can kind of equalize the, the score. Like, what, just what's your vision on I that? look at it dealing with it from both short-term and long-term perspective. Systemic issues in general are really hard to tackle because they're embedded in a system for a reason. The mm -hmm. system is designed to do what the system is doing, right? And it's up to us to change that, defy those odds, defy the status quo, and, and make a difference. Looking at education, outreach, access, affordability, convenience are all critical components. Meeting clients where they are, going into hard to reach communities, working with healthcare centers, FQHCs, so many of our critical partners in the healthcare industry that represent the populations that we're talking about. Women should not be discriminated against based on their income, their level of insurance, whether they're uninsured, underinsured, or they have no insurance at all. And we know that that often is the case. When you go into places that are medical institutions, the first thing they ask you is, where's your insurance where's your card? Insurance? If Absolutely. you have Medicaid, you're treated differently, and we've heard stories around that. So we have in our office a maternal mortality health task force and it's composed of doulas midwives birth workers and we've been talking about policy how can we do this at a policy local level and state level in terms of new measures to really make sure that the department of health is educating residents on doulas and midwives we need to develop a resource guide in multiple languages from a language diverse perspective but also culturally sensitive as well let me uh, introduce you to the vice chair of mm -hmm. <laughs> obstetrics and gynecology at, Jaco gynecology at uh, mm -hmm. Jacoby because Dr. Addis has been mm -hmm. working on these very issues for a very long time. Um, Dr. Addis, let's break down some of the issues here that uh, the borough president has um, uh, referred to. Let's start with prenatal care. Black and Latino women are less likely to receive prenatal care uh, in their first trimester of uh, pregnancy and to have more than five prenatal care visits total over the course of their pregnancy. Uh, what do we do well in prenatal care in the Bronx and at Jacoby? And wh where are the, the blank lines that you say, this has got to be filled in, we got to do more? Yeah. Well, first I want to say thank you so much for paying so much attention to this issue. It's a real passion of mine. Um, and as you said, I've been working on this a long time. Prenatal care is the core. Prenatal care has been shown to reduce morbidity and mortality, also improve neonatal survival, mm -hmm. right, and success later in life. Um, we do all kinds of screening in prenatal care, um, in ultrasound screening, lab work, testing for gestational diabetes, for sexually transmitted infections. Why aren't people getting care? One is many of them have had experienced medical racism in the past, and they're reluctant to come in because of that baggage that they're carrying that I'm going to be treated badly again. And I just want to interject this verifies what the borough president Absolutely. is saying. So those words mm -hmm. are not just, well, that's what she thinks, but here's evidence because this is somebody who deals mm -hmm. with it every day. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Absolutely. It's very important to point that out. And then other issues of systemic racism as well, right? Because system systemic racism is the entire system. I always say, you know, I've worked in other countries, I've worked in the U.S., pregnant women are the canaries in the coal mine, right? They're actually very, very healthy. It is hard. It's hard to kill a pregnant woman. So you have to do a lot wrong, a lot wrong along the pathway. We have a long legacy of systemic racism in this country, right? And it pervades every facet of our society. So pregnant women not only have to interact with the medical system, they also have to get maybe food assistance, employment, child care, right? Those stressors are very, very important in the health of a pregnant woman. She's generally often putting her existing children or family members first. And then, you know, in addition to that, she may have experienced traumas, intergenerational traumas, intergenerational racism that are all impacting her. We know from current research that epigenetics um, and advanced cellular weathering really have effects multi-generational, right? So it's not enough to say to a person, well, you're sick, you have a disease. These things are coming intergenerationally. So to just approach it as individual level is incorrect. Uh, to me, listening to what you say, there's, it's a two-part problem. Number one is education, so that people who come in and they haven't had the, the, the care, they haven't that's had right. the doulas, they haven't had people to explain to them what needs to be done, so that's one. And then number two, the availability of services, which of mm -hmm. course is what uh, the borough president wants to specifically uh, address. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, the numbers, and, and I just want to show, we have some of these numbers of prenatal care uh, in um, the borough of uh, the Bronx. So if we could uh, put that up on the screen there, you could see mm. that um, in, in the Bronx, compared to the rest of the city, look at the, the Bronx compared to Staten Island, uh, five times as many people are not getting um, prenatal care, uh, either or they're getting it late or never well, even getting it. 
That's it's it's really striking. Is how do we address it? Is yeah. is is the borough president on the the right track here? Absolutely. The more the merrier. We need a lot more availability. Um, at Jacoby, we really try to prioritize our prenatal visits. So when come, someone comes for care, we get them in for an initial OB visit. There is not a long wait to get care. Same thing at North Central Bronx. But why wouldn't people come in? They may not approach us until later. Mm -hmm. Some people are coming from other countries sometimes, but also people are hesitant to get care, have bad experiences, don't know who to call. One thing I want to emphasize, I'm Latina myself, I'm Spanish speaking. A lot of immigrants and people who don't speak English don't realize that we can find insurance for you. Every pregnancy goes covered in New York you say State. We can find, we can find mm -hmm. coverage for you. And we really want people to know that do not let insurance and cost be a barrier, a barrier. to getting prenatal and pregnancy related care. At health and hospitals, we will find that coverage. Nobody goes uncovered. Um, we want to embrace everybody, no matter where you're from, what language you speak, who you are, what you look mm -hmm. like, and what kind of insurance you have or not. Uh, just to be clear, just because we really want people to make sure they, and women particularly, to get this information, uh, NCB is health and hospitals, yep. Jacoby is health and hospitals, and down at Lincoln uh, yes. Medical Center mm -hmm. is also health. So, so, you know, put that on your list and say, I'm going in there, mm -hmm. I deserve, I get, and, I, and, and it exists, and I want to make sure I get it. Let's just talk, because we talk about the women, but let's talk about the children. Yeah. Infant mortality, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we have some numbers for that, too, is absolutely uh, frightening. Um, and again, the same kind of thing, and, and Madam Borough President knows this, deaths per 1,000, New York City has 4.1. Of course, uh, unfortunately, the Bronx is at 5.0. But then the, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, breakdown of ethnicity, uh, the borough president talked about uh, black women, black non-Hispanic women, 7.8% of mm -hmm. uh, babies don't make it. That, that is really scary to me. I mean, uh, you, mm -hmm. we don't want to think of um, these uh, numbers. Um, borough president also talked about cesarean births. Now they're encouraged mm -hmm. then to get cesarean births. Yep. Um, and and uh, those, are, those uh, incidents are higher among black women and people of color. Um, what about the advice that they're getting and how do, how do we turn these numbers around? As, as I research this, it's positively scary. Well, let's talk about some of the contributors to that. So we have preterm birth, right? Preterm babies are less likely to survive and more likely to have problems. Preventing that preterm birth in the first place is really important. It's multifactorial, it's difficult to do, but certainly the stressors and the multi-generational stressors and systemic racism is a huge component of that. Two, one of our biggest problems, um, health problems in um, pregnant women is preeclampsia and high blood pressure of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It's very scary, it's very dangerous. Many women don't know that it's a problem. They don't realize that it, they have a severe, unrelenting headache. They really need to come in and check their blood pressure, even if they've never had a blood pressure problem in the past. It is one of the biggest killers of women. Um, and then in addition, gestational diabetes has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. About 19% of our patients at Jacoby have gestational diabetes. And if you don't know it and don't get control of your diabetes, it can affect your baby in the future. Just to put a plug for one of the programs we have at Jacoby to address this particular issue is that we found that mothers and babies were having to go to separate appointments and it was very difficult to get to both when you're in the postpartum period, you're exhausted. What we did at Jacoby was we created a mother-baby program. Mother and baby are seen in the same room in the pediatrics department. Mother doesn't have to go somewhere else. And we can educate her as a team on how to take care of her newborn, improve that survival, get contraception if she wants it, and also get care for herself so that we can optimize her now for this postpartum period and for future pregnancies. Uh, Madam Borough President, uh, you uh, worked alongside uh, public advocate Jumani mm -hmm. Williams uh, to improve outreach and education regarding the standards for uh, respectful care yep. at birth. Uh, is there legislation out there? No, I, I got it from your office. Uh, 11 bills passed last August uh, requiring the Department of Health to establish a doula program and all mm -hmm. those things. Can we address this legislatively in some form? What, what, what's your point of view on yeah, that? Yes, so joining public advocate Jamani Williams, uh, Speaker Adrian Adams, and the women's delegation, of course, uh, in the city council, the women's caucus, a tremendous level of support, majority-led women uh, in the city council, and certainly a lot of mothers that understand and get it and have their own experiences as well. I'm proud to say that package did pass the city council, and it was signed into law by Mayor Eric Adams, who also believes in supporting programs and more doulas, midwives, and birth workers. Uh, and I want to recognize a couple of months ago, Mayor Adams and Deputy Mayor Ann Williams-Isom made an announcement on, on 
maternal health care services in 33 neighborhoods across the city of New York. And many of those neighborhoods are in the Bronx. The High Bridge, Marsania, Tremont, Crotona Park areas where we have the highest levels of maternal morbidity and recognizing that there really is a need. There are credible messengers on the ground, like at Jacoby and NCB and many of our FQHCs. They're doing the work. They need support. They need more money. They need more resources so that they can Is grow that and governmental serve. Money, governmental think? contracts, contracts, DOHMH and okay. uh, State Health Department. They need more money. Another factor that I'll add, and I'm so glad that Dr. Addis mentioned the idea of marrying mother and mm -hmm. baby together at the same appointments. Transportation is a huge issue. Because if you have other children at mm -hmm. home, you can't get to that doctor's appointment. No one is watching your kids. You have to bring your kids with you. Transportation is costly. If you have to travel across the Bronx, you have to go elsewhere. That is a big inhibitor to many of our women coming in for care. And then obviously a lot of the horror stories and just nightmares, it's traumatic when you've had a bad experience at a doctor. Yes. You're supposed to have a good relationship with your I, doctor. And it's also traumatic and, and in a very fundamental way. Mm -hmm. If you live in the East Bronx and you're trying to go to the West Bronx or you want to get to NCB and That's the right. buses didn't run or something like That's that. That's right. Um, it's frustrating. It, it, um, uh, it, it, it just strikes me. Uh, I'll, I'll add in my part about the media. You talked about Mayor Adams making an announcement, about making a commitment. Somehow that got lost and in all the headlines. Now, we know Mayor Adams is very busy. We know mm -hmm. you're very busy on many issues. But this issue hasn't risen up, up, the, up the scale that all of a sudden it's generally talked about when, of course, all of us came from pregnant women. So let's, uh, <laughs> who are we right. going to support? You know. <laughs> you're here. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Addis, um, let's just uh, talk about the general health involved. If mm -hmm. uh, you've mm -hmm. talked about some of the things, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, Admiral. all these things are a factor. Um, I guess that goes in the education piece to mm -hmm. say, if you're going to have a child, you, you've got to you know, do your best on your own, too. Um, is that part of, of a maternal health program, or is that like, well, you do that, and then you come in? You know what I mean? It would be nice to marry that together. Well, it starts before you're related. pregnant, right? It starts in general care. We want you to come for GYN care. We want you to come for contraception if you don't want to get pregnant, because we want you to get pregnant when you want to, not when it just happens to happen. We want you to plan that. You know, we also want you to be able to not be pregnant if you don't want to be, right? It includes mm -hmm. preventing pregnancy, but we do offer the full spectrum of reproductive health care at health and hospitals and Jacoby, and again, regardless of ability to pay. Um, but in terms of health education, with women with pre-existing conditions, they can absolutely get pregnant and have healthy, successful, uncomplicated pregnancies. But it takes planning yeah. and work. I, I want to bring up something. We, we do this sometimes on the show, and it happens in our conversation beforehand, um, the, the notion of a womb bus, and I want to say a mm -hmm. womb bus. Um, <laughs> I want to say it right, and you weren't aware of it. Um, Madam Borough President, talk about the womb bus, uh, the people at the birthing place. This, this is a concept, and I think we just uh, introduced something to Jacoby Medical yes. Center that they kind of endorsed. So let's, <laughs> what, what's your review So when I became is? Borough President, I met this young, incredible birth worker, doula named Myla Flores, and she came to us with this idea of uh, bringing out mm -hmm. a womb bus, and we saw pictures, it's a pink bus, and we were able to help her last year, FY23, along with Council Member Althea Stevens, Council Member Beatina Sanchez, and we were able to get her funding so she can get the mobile unit out. And last summer was the debut of Womb Bus, W-O-M-B Bus, Womb Bus, <laughs> and it's out on the streets, and we were at major events, at major parks, and just open spaces, because you know people are outside, right? And this is about going into communities. And, and what, what do they do? So the Womb Bus provides a wealth of services and resources and programs, referral services for expecting mothers. And this summer, I'm really proud to say that Myla was able to get additional support, and we're now going to offer free sonograms on the bus as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think with COVID-19, we've learned a lot that healthcare is mobile now, and mm -hmm. we have mobile units all over the borough from dental and other services. And it's really great if you have a mobile bus that's right outside your park or your playground, right? And, and that's what we want to do. But I and think that, it's just that connecting eases the people. transportation yes. issue too to yes. get simple and getting people to come in because once you go there, you go to the doctor. Yeah. You know, I, I try not to compromise on these issues. Um, how do we get more of them? <laughs> more funding. The one is nice. Listen, more you, funding. you've known me a long support. time. I don't like to compromise. We need we need elected officials and we need government to understand this is important and really buy into it. 
This has been a crisis for a long time. And when you think about what a crisis is and what gains national attention, like gun violence and mass incarceration and the school to prison pipeline, maternal health care should be right up at the top of the list as well. Because the work that Dr. Addis is doing at Jacoby and NCB, saving lives. We're saving the lives of mothers and their unborn children, and we're allowing them a chance to lead healthy, productive lives. And if we do anything in this world, we have to make sure that we not only save lives, protect life, and we allow our families to live healthy, stable lives. Uh, you know, That's I'm, our job. I'm, I'm smiling when you say we're, we're saving lives, but then, which again, we, we talked about infant mortality. Think about the children. If the Absolutely. moms are doing better, guess who's going to do better? That's and right. then you worry about who's in school and are they healthy? I mean, this is uh, really what this is about. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you um, about this, Dr. Addis. Maternal mortality has been higher in abortion restricting states, mm -hmm. ironically, mm -hmm. um, I suppose. Um, maybe you could just clarify what happened with uh, Mifepristone mm -hmm. and where we are at. Where does that play? in the role of, of this whole reproductive uh, spectrum. And let's just clear that up so people know what they've been hearing about on yes. TV and everything else. Thank you for asking. So mifepristone is one of two medications that's used for medication abortion, which means you take a pill and it can t end the pregnancy without requiring a surgical procedure. It's one way to do an abortion. Another way is a surgical abortion, um, which involves uh, usually a suction, dilation, and curatage. Um, so medical abortion is safe, it's effective, um, we've been using it at health and hospitals for years. Uh, Mifepristone is one of those medications and it has made medication abortion safer and easier and more accessible. Um, recently, there was a challenge in, in the federal courts to um, the, the FDA approval of Mifepristone and temporarily that judge ruled that that approval was um, inadequate in some way. Um, mm -hmm. And so very temporarily that made us nervous and, and made us think that we were not gonna have Mifepristone available. However, the Supreme Court has put a temporary hold on that ruling, so mifepristone is available. Even if it wasn't, we can still do medication abortion with the other medication called misoprostol, but right now we have both misoprostol and mifepristone available. They are available at Jacoby and North Central Bronx, um, and so and it is available in New York State, absolutely. I, I just want to do a shout out that the Morrisania Sexual Health Clinic, the first uh, city-run clinic mm -hmm. in the nation offering uh, free abortion meds. And listen, we're not prejudging <laughs> anything, Get, get advice, talk to the right people, That's talk right. to people like Dr. Addis, find the right people to make the right decisions. Um, Madam Borough President, we could talk about this for a long time, but yes. I know Bronx Week is coming yes. up. And uh, she's got her cheerleader suit on. <laughs> and uh, let, let's listen. We're all going to cheer for our home borough, the Bronx. What's coming up? Uh, BronxNet is going to be there at as yes. many events Always as we are. can. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about Bronx Week. We are excited to host the annual 2023 Bronx Week. It begins Monday, May 8th through Sunday, May 21st. We are the only borough that recognizes its own week. And because we are special, <laughs> with them it out there? is 10 days and not a week. <laughs> and it's all things Bronx. We honor first responders, educators, seniors, veterans, schools, uh, diff different organizations. I'm going to emcee the veterans, uh, breakfast, veterans, veterans, yes. veterans lunch for, Absolutely. for the 15th time. So we are excited. We have a new group of inductees, Bronx natives that have contributed significantly to the borough that we're going to induct in the Bronx Walk of Fame. And then Sunday culminates with our annual Bronx Children's Parade. We have the Bronx Ball Saturday evening. But most importantly for all viewers, Monday, May 8th, we are doing our official Bronx Week kickoff with our announcement of our Bronx inductees. Every borough president that has sat in that <laughs> chair, I have said during this time, so give us a hint, who are the four people? But the next, <laughs> you're not going to do that, are you? No. Uh, Maybe it's coming up. And don't forget the website, ilovethebronx.com. Oh, which the is easy website. to remember. ilovethebronx.com. E easy to remember. All right, let's go back to, I wanted to make sure to give you a chance to do that, and BronxNet will be there covering it. You'll be able to see everything live on the web and who knows what else we're doing. The answer is everything. Um, but let's just um, uh, summarize then. So, um, Dr. Addis, let's just talk about um, what the borough president is talking about as far as a birthing clinic and what that can add to the services that you already provide at um, uh, Jacobia Medical Center. Absolutely. I'm a huge advocate of midwives, and actually our uh, labor and delivery services are led by midwives at both Jacobia and North Central Bronx. Um, midwives are able to reduce the rate of C-section, conduct a healthy vaginal birth, 
even in medically complicated patients. There's no reason that you can't have a midwife-led vaginal birth, even if you have hypertension, diabetes, other complications. Um, but there are many people who are medically low risk um, and would be able to uh, give birth in a birthing center. Um, and birthing centers can look different, so I'm not going to say exactly what that might look like, but it would have to be low-risk patients. Mm -hmm. um, and that can also alleviate some of the pressure on our tertiary referring mm -hmm. centers to take care of those sick patients who really need that level of care. And then coordinated care, I mean, we obviously, uh, healthcare is the largest industry in our borough. It is. Um, then, um, you know, let's, let's all work together. What, what's your vision uh, about, and, and are we talking about a location? Are we talking about a bus? <laughs> I mean, how, how do you view it and, and um, uh, in relation to the things like, like they do, maternity services, physical exams, mm -hmm. pap tests, family planning, osteoporosis uh, prevention and treatment? Yeah. Where does this fit into that spectrum? So I'd say all of the above, <laughs> and there are other parts of our city that do have existing birthing centers. So we're, you know, obviously working with those entities on visits and just collaborations. Uh, our Health and Human Services Division does amazing work on maternal health care, and I'm really proud. We have a new newsletter called Bronx Health Matters because it really does. Your the health matters. Internet newsletter, and email. It's, it's on the website. And if they want uh, on your website. On our website, yes, Great. Bronx Health Matters. Okay. But I really do see uh, again low risk patients where we're able to provide the wraparound services and really provide the support and reduce the burden on a lot of our hospitals that are taking care of high-risk patients. At the end of the day, I want the health disparities to be addressed. We have high asthma rates, uh, poor health outcomes, obesity, so many things we deal with. If we don't deal with health and the food we eat, access to healthy food, the affordability, the accessibility of that, stable housing, then what are we doing? This is all interrelated, it's all connected, and you cannot talk about one without the other. And to me, uh, this is the importance of doing what we just did. Uh, That's right. I mentioned, and, and you mentioned that the mayor, you know, had an mm -hmm. announcement. It was barely covered, yep. barely of interest to people. Yet it should be of interest to everybody. Absolutely. Because if her moms aren't going to do well, then nobody's going to yep. do well. The final thing I'll say is all the numbers that you cited. Just think about the people that are behind those yeah. numbers and the children. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be a call the, to action the, in itself. The volume of numbers, the volumes uh, of people uh, mm -hmm. in those situations. Uh, Dr. Uh, Veronica Addis, Vice Chair at, uh, of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Jacoby Medical Center. Thank you. Madam Borough President, you'll come yeah. back for time number Absolutely, 24. Absolutely, number 24. Uh, <laughs> but who's counting? Uh, <laughs> folks, uh, we thank them for coming. We thank our producer, Rebecca Hemick. Our director is Nick Marrero. We have a cast of thousands working with us. In the studio, my buddy Arlene is here, and she really helped us put the show together. And uh, so we'll see you next week. Good night.